If I'm going to make the same amount of money as a travel nurse, why would I even bother to go back to CRNA school? You may have heard this question before, and I was a travel nurse for about two and a half years. I'm currently a first year student registered nurse anesthetist. And while you should never choose a job based off of the compensation, we really believe in pay transparency and just education. So we're going to talk about compensation profiles for travel nurses, staff nurses in California, CRNAs at a staff job, and then CRNA locums. Yes, which is something that that I think a lot of people don't realize they're often comparing apples to oranges like oh a travel nurse job versus a staff CRNA job or not even realizing that there's plenty of staff nursing jobs out there that actually pay just as much as some travel right. contracts <laughs> so you know it's really important to base your decision not just on money I think that's what's scaring people away from going back to grad school who are interested we're not here to pressure you into grad school or say that CRNA is the right career for you it's a very niche unique path and a very like big decision because the grad school and the responsibility of the job like it's completely different than bedside nursing yeah. but if you are interested in CRNA school and you're talking yourself out of it this video is for you I just wanted to introduce myself my name is Anna I am a first year student registered nurse anesthetist. I was a travel nurse for about two and a half years. I worked a lot of COVID ICU. I worked neuro ICU. CV SICU was my staff nursing background and I did a couple of travel CV SICU assignments. And then I ended out my career as a travel per diem PACU nurse. And I actually last night just quit my last job and I'm a full-time student. Ah, we're so <laughs> proud. So hard to let go of that sometimes. <laughs> and it does like feel really weird. Sometimes you don't know what your last is gonna be, right? Like we were just talking about that today. I walked out of that shift and I didn't know it was my last shift but that's a separate podcast. That's a separate day, it's a separate day. <laughs> anyway, so let me introduce myself quick. My name's Chrissy, I'm a nurse anesthetist if you don't know me. I've been a CRNA for a little over five and a half years. It'll be six in July. And I worked in two different academic medical centers as a CRNA, and before that I was a CVICU nurse, also in an academic medical center. So I know a lot about different CRNA staff jobs. I have a lot of friends who do locums. I'm constantly browsing the different per diem and locums gigs out there. So <laughs> I definitely think I have some pretty good insight on the different types of contracts. So I think the first compensation profile that we're gonna talk about is travel nursing. What goes into a travel nurse's pay? What all is included benefits wise in a travel nursing pay package? And I'm gonna talk about that because I was a travel nurse for about two and a half years. When you're looking at a travel nursing contract, there are a couple of factors you need to really look at. Contracts are usually 13 weeks long and they usually are made up of a blended compensation package of your hourly rate and your per diem stipend. I have a video here talking about travel nursing contracts and choosing the best one, and it talks a lot about the GSA stipend to make sure that you're getting the maximum amount of allocation for your housing and living expenses, so go check out that video. But you need to look at the compensation profile as a whole because you're being paid based off of your location in part. So if you're taking a travel nursing contract in San Francisco or in Washington, D.C., or in New York City, you are going to get a higher amount allotted from the government that says, hey, the travel nursing agency can pay you $130 per day versus if you're in Alabama, you'll be paid like $70 a day Ooh, to that. cover your cost of living, your housing, and your food. And then that amount of money is tax-free. If you're duplicating expenses, which is this video, you need to <laughs> check that out because that's very commonly misunderstood. So your travel nursing compensation package is made up of your hourly rate, your overtime rate, and your per diem stipend that is tax-free. So a couple of things that are included are- Per diem stipend, or you mean like your living stipend? Or so is it's that called, the term? It's called the per diem, like okay, daily rate. It. It's also called like the GSA stipend. It's called the per diem. Got it. It's called the tax-free stipend. There's like a couple of different names for it. Okay. One thing that travel nursing doesn't include mostly is paid time off. So yeah. that is something that's going to be different from even a staff nursing job. I also will say some agencies do, you do accrue sick time. So I was with one agency for over a year and I accrued six and a half days of sick time. I couldn't schedule that time in advance as I was traveling in between contracts. I couldn't schedule to use any of those days. It I had, had to be a real call out sick day. Yeah. Okay. I had to physically call out sick in order to use those days. And that was also only six days in a year. And I got those six days because I was working overtime. And this is something we were talking about before we started filming. A lot of times a travel nurse will, I'll have up on screen here, what the travel nursing contracts look like. You can make even in 2023, $5,000 a week as a travel nurse in some specialties. However, 
that five grand a week, you might be working 60 hours, which Yeah, then, so what's your hourly rate actually coming out Exactly. To? Like, that's insane. And then your hourly rate, if you're working 60 hours a week, how is that on your body physically? Is it physically sustainable to work 60 hour weeks to make that good money? Nobody's saying that travel nursing isn't great money or life-changing money. But what we're saying is, hey, here's all the information and here's what it kind of compares to in other like very highly compensated jobs. Another thing with benefits in traveling is that you can have benefits through the travel nursing agency that you're working with. However, if you choose to take benefits from your travel nursing agency, then you are kind of stuck with that agency. Yeah. And then to actually like use them and get exactly. Out of them. You probably should opt to have private health insurance as a travel nurse so that you can choose between different agencies and pick the highest paying contract. Another thing that I found out <laughs> in retrospect is that if you take benefits through your agency, you have to be employed on the first of the month and you can't take more than three weeks off in between contracts or else you lose your health insurance. Yeah, so then the perk and the whole allure of travel nursing, in my opinion, is freedom. Like yeah, freedom of time, exactly. freedom of location. Like you want to be able to go where you want to go, when you want to go, and work when you want to work. To me, that's the whole reason to travel nurse is to explore new cities and like take control of your time back. And if you end up in a place where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm actually stuck because I need health insurance. And then you're just working a full-time job and maybe you're working 60 hours a week or 48 hours a week. And you know, you're working all the time. You can't even <laughs> see the city that you're in. Yeah. You're like 60 hours a week on night shift. That's horrible. Actually, actually, that's way worse than grad school. I don't know why you guys are so afraid of grad school. That's actually torture. I will say <laughs> grad school is actually pretty fun. I like, yeah. it's very simple. I have my little anatomy flashcards and I have my little iPad and I'm drawing out my anatomy. It's great so far. Don't be afraid to go back to school if you want to. You also don't have to go to school. But again, kind of in summary, travel nursing compensation is made up of your hourly rate, your overtime rate, which in California, if you'd work over eight hours because of the unions, you get time and a half after eight hours, which is awesome. Wow, after eight? That's, That's part so of why cool. the California contracts pay more is because every shift you you work you're getting four Your hours like overtime. overtime wow exactly. i had no idea about that okay that's crazy which kind of leads into like the staff nursing in california comparison yeah which do you want to do that first or the staff or let's CRNA talk about first? let's talk about staff crna first yeah. i think a lot of people look at the total compensation they can make mm -hmm. as a travel nurse and they're like i don't have to go back to school i don't have to quit my job for three right. years i don't have to do any extra prereqs or stress about getting in and then like you know i'm gonna just like do this contract and make the same amount anyway why would i make that sacrifice because CRA school let's be real it is a big time sacrifice yeah. like when I was in CRNA school I was in an integrated program and so during my training there were semesters where I would be taking five courses that were heavy dense courses like my physiology my pharmacology my anesthesia courses like Hard hardcore yeah. studying in depth like you know really going down to the cellular level while I was also studying for clinical and in the operating room and then you have to prepare for your cases the yep. next day and if you're not prepared you get kicked out and if you don't have an 82 or higher on your exams it's a fail if you don't pass the class at the higher than an 82 it's yeah. a fail and you have to repeat it. So like the stakes are really high and it is very intense. Once school gets more intense like that, you do have to quit your job. So this is a financial sacrifice. It's a time sacrifice. It's a stress sacrifice. So I understand why people are afraid to leave travel nursing when they're like, well, if the money's the same, dot, dot, dot. One big thing I'll say about being a staff CRNA that's very different is the quality of life and the yeah. longevity of your career. That's the number one thing you need to think about. I have never met a 70 year old bedside nurse not once in my life. No. I have met tons of, I mean, every single day I work with CRNAs who are in their 70s who come back per diem just for fun, just to pay for their cruise, yeah. <laughs> just to pay they're for their golfing. grandkids' money, <laughs> like they're going on a ski trip. They're always fit. I don't know how they're always fit. They're 70, they're it's skiing. because they work one day a week and they're, they're rich. And it's like you can be a CRNA as long as you want. It's a career with longevity. The second thing is your benefits package looks radically different. So yes, a staff CRNA might be making between 150 grand to 250 grand on average depending on the city you work in how much experience you have so anywhere from 150 to 50 is like a reasonable estimate new grad in the south 150 you know someone with a couple years under their belt in the northeast 250 i have friends on the west coast who are making 300 just at their regular staff job okay so like this is what the range looks like yep and again our benefits compensation packages are radically different so yes if you work for the same travel nurse agency consistently you can get a 401k plan or a 403b plan that you have some matching right usually it's like a 2.5 percent match right? i had a 2.5 percent okay match. so like yeah. some minimal match right when we, we think about matching for retirement that means that you are taking money pre-tax dollars you 
put it in that 401k account. Mm -hmm. It goes into the stock market. 2.5% of what you put in, your company's throwing an additional on top of, right? It's free money. It's free money. Yeah. Always do the match no matter where you work. When you work as a CRNA, not only will you have a matching package, it's usually at a higher rate. It's usually closer to 5%. Really? If you work for a private group, usually there's some profit sharing, which means that as the group makes profits, they give you like either dividends or stocks, or they help you put it in like some sort of an additional special account. Like usually you're getting extra money going into the stock market on top of that. You are getting huge amounts of pay time off. At my last job, I got seven and a half weeks of pay time off a year. Okay. And that included my sick time to be fair, but it all was just one bank and I could use it for, you know, going to conferences, vacation, sick time, whatever I needed it to be. And I was actually allowed to take it. Unlike when I was a bedside nurse, I would like put in a request for a vacation and the answer was always no. Like right. I pretty much always got my request granted as a CRMA as long as you booked it out ahead enough. How many weeks would you say you used on average? I used five weeks out of my year and okay. I would always keep two weeks left over just in case like something okay. happened. So five weeks a year, I was getting paid That's my CRNA rate and like going on vacation, catching up around the house. I would just take vacation time just to take it sometimes if I was yeah. burned out. So this is why we have so much longevity. At my current job, things are broken up a little differently. I get mm -hmm. four weeks of vacation, an education week to go to a conference. Okay. And then I have sick time separate and personal days and like floating holidays. It adds up to about six weeks. Okay. And after a couple of years working for the company, you get that seventh week, you get an extra vacation week. So it's almost the same amount of PTO time. So this is a standard staff package. Again, my retirement at this job, I have a 401k that is not matched by the company, but there's a pension, which is like, pension. yeah, there's a pension plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, the salary to salary is the same, but you're getting paid for all the days you're not working. And you are getting all of this extra money put into your retirement for later. There's a job in Pennsylvania. I'm not going to say the name of the institution. They're literally putting in 20% of your salary into your retirement account every single wow, year because they are wild. looking to attract staff. Like this is life changing money. So not only as a CRNA, are you making over 200 grand there yes. to start? You're getting 20% of that. So like 40 grand a year is getting into dumped into the stock market without you touching a single penny. Whoa. So it looks like I may be moving to Pennsylvania. <laughs> it's just, I mean, think this is like, this is real life changing money and you're working 40 hours a week. Reproductive benefits too, right? Oh, you usually get reproductive. Okay. So reproductive benefits are getting more popular. Not everyone has it, mm -hmm. but at my last job, we had a $30,000 lifetime fertility benefit. So if you have to do IVF, if you adopt a child, mm -hmm. all, it could go towards all those different things. At my current job, I think it's half of that. That's still like a good amount of money it's towards it. for egg freezing if you're a young person who yeah, is not just, ready, not to, ready have to have kids, kids yet. yet. Like these are things that are really important to these think about. These are benefits that like to me, coming from the staff nursing mindset are like unheard of. I'm like, you get a fertility benefit like if I needed to do IVF that would be partially covered by work that's like wild I also again breaking it back down if you're working a travel nursing contract and you are realistically working maybe 11 months out of the year and you're being unpaid for those four weeks off if you're taking high paying contracts you can maybe make like 170 to 240 thousand dollars that's really kind of the max that you can make as a travel nurse unless you were working during the heyday of 2020 and you did those wild ten thousand dollar a week contracts those contracts don't exist anymore yeah like and what's you, the quality of like those contracts the highest paying travel contracts are probably in either really horrible locations or yeah. really horrible working conditions i have right? a youtube video about that you don't want to take the highest paying contract i would almost never recommend taking the highest paying travel contract because it means that they have no staff and that the working conditions are horrible and it's unsafe to your license. And then again, circling back to, okay, well, staff CRNA versus travel nursing. Yes. A new grad CRNA might start at $160,000 while a travel nurse might make 200 grand in a year. But for harder work, <laughs> but you harder can't work, take vacation without feeling poor. <laughs> that's also a new grad salary. So yeah, it's a new grad salary, a few, right? A few years of experience into being a staff CRNA you're over 200 most states in the country. And let's say you want to work per diem or right. overtime. So most jobs have overtime available and True. per diem is really easy to pick up as a CRNA. You can, so like, let's say, oh, I'm used to working 60 hours a week as travelers. I'm more used to working 48 hours a week as travelers. You can work that one extra day mm -hmm. picking up per diem mm -hmm. for generally 150 bucks an hour. It's like a pretty standard per diem rate. I would say it's 120 also, to 200 an hour, depending on what city you're in. There's also, especially for a new grad CRNA, let's say you want to pay off your student loans. There's call shifts available. You can work overtime. You can work a per diem. And then again, you're comparing a travel nursing, which is really the most you can make as a bedside nurse to the least you can make new, as a CRNA yeah, to yeah. a new grad CRNA. And we haven't even talked about travel CRNA yet. That'll be the last point. So we're already seeing 
Yes, you can make a lot of money as a travel nurse, but you're working really physically hard labor for that money. You're not getting paid for your time off and you have to work like long contracts. You have to constantly move. You're not really compensated for your relocation expenses, which mm-hmm. is something we'll compare think later. That. Oh yeah, we always have like sign-on bonuses, relocation packages, and we also always have continuing education money. Mm. So for your CEUs, you usually get um, a couple thousand dollars a year. So like if I want to go to a conference, usually right. like 2000 is like a pretty standard seat, um, continuing education package. And then if you work for a hospital instead of a private group, you might get tuition assistance also. True. So my old job gave us $8,000 of tuition assistance a year. My current job gives us 12,000 of tuition assistance a year. Wow. So if I want to go back for my doctorate, I can take one class at a time and have most of it covered, which is a huge deal. That is a huge deal, especially for people like us who just love school. We just love school. <laughs> so I think that's travel nursing compared to new grad staff CRNA and staff CRNA. I think the next thing to compare is staff nursing in California. Oh my gosh. So- Guys. I wish I knew this. I would have just become a staff nurse in California and parked it right there. (laughs) So the reason nursing in California is so good is because of their really strong unions. Uh, We want to have a whole podcast about this, but you should definitely all read the book, A Collective Bargain. This is like, I have chills thinking about it. This book should be mandatory reading for all nursing students, all teachers, all teaching students, like anybody that works. What's the author's name? Uh, Jane McAlevey. McAlevey. Okay. So we're going to beg her to have her on the podcast. (laughs) I would love that. (laughs) We don't know if she'll say yes. We're manifesting that she'll come on the podcast. We're manifesting it. Manifest it with us. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. She is an incredible activist, author. I've read almost all of her work. I have one more book to go. But this book is essential. The reason that working in California is so good is because of over 45 years of really strong union activism in California. So in nursing in particular, there's so interesting and there's a whole chapter in this book about the LA teacher strike and how mm. they were able to get kids outside into public spaces and like, ah, oh, it's so good. But In California, the unions were able to pass laws about nurse to patient ratios. They beat Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was a whole thing like this. Again, read this book. It's so good. But working in California, you have laws about mandated nurse to patient ratios. The state of California is not a unionized state, but there's a ton of facilities that are union. And when there's a ton of facilities that are union, even the ones that are not union kind of have to match what the union hospitals are doing. Or else they'll lose staff. Or else they don't have staff. And this is where the phrase, a rising tide raises all ships come from. Like if the working conditions at all these union places are up here, and then you have a hospital that rhymes with, I won't say it, but like down here, they have to then match the working conditions to attract staff. It's like huge. So in California, you have laws about nurse patient ratios. You have an hour long like nap break at most hospitals. Overnight, right? Overnight. That's crazy. You get three meals, you get breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Three meals? Yeah. How long are your breakfast and dinner breaks? I get a 15 breakfast, a 30 and a 30. Drink day shift. A 30 dinner. Yeah. Oh wow. I or some people will choose to take like an hour breakfast, so then like a or people can do what they want. But well, then, and you actually have a break nurse. Okay, right. so this is like mind-blowing to me. A person <laughs> comes in and actually is assigned to your patients, right? Yeah. So you're giving report and you're handing off the patient care and they're doing the patient care while you're gone. So you can actually walk away and have peace of mind. They'll pass your meds. They'll take your patient to CT. Like the whole job is to be a resource. Yeah, nurse. unlike amazing. everywhere else where like it's like, oh, like I have my pod mates <laughs> keeping an ear out for the alarms. And then if multiple things are going on at once, like they may or may not know what's happening to your so patient. Safe. So it's like, so safe. that's scary. So like... I need a whole blog post about the patient mortality that comes with nurse patient ratios. Like having nurse patient ratios saves patient lives. It increases nurse retention. Nurse retention in California is the best in the country. And the pay is also great. Like nurses. Oh, they have pensions too. They have pensions. So I'm going to flash, like we'll have up here the starting pay rate at let's say UCSF in California. You can see that a new grad nurse in 2022 or 2021 Starts at like seventy one or seventy two dollars an hour. Now, to be fair, That's the Bay Area grad. is obviously super expensive. Yes. But if you were like a twenty two year old nurse and you just graduated and you're living with roommates and like maybe you're in Oakland or something instead, like right. that's a lot of so money. Like you can make expensive. that work. So for new grad nurses everywhere else in the country, starting pay is still about thirty dollars an hour. And in the rent, South, it's still in the 20s. It's still in the 20s in the South. And rent is expensive everywhere in the country right now. Yeah. Rent is not double or triple as expensive in the Bay Area, but nurses are making almost three times as much. So That's the thing. You, you have to really do the math really and ahead. you're shocked. So then if you look here, you can see that an experienced bedside nurse with 30 years of experience at a union hospital in California 
they're making between 170 and 190 thousand dollars. That's a staff nurse. They have paid time off. They have a pension. They have like benefits packages. So a staff nurse in California with no graduate degree can make amazing money. And as a person who has made that salary before, mm -hmm. I know how much money you can afford to pay in rent, especially if your student loans aren't that bad. Or even if you have student loans like me, like I had a lot of student loans. I was making that much. I was easily able to pay two grand a month in Philly. Mm -hmm. And then in New York, I'm paying literally more than double that. Right. And like, I can afford it comfortably. Like it's fine. Right. Like I can pay my bills. I can pay my student loans. I can afford expensive rent. My pet has an obnoxiously expensive dog walker. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. And I still can't go shopping at Christmas and like go on vacation. Like you're it, not stressed out. I'm not stressed about money. And guys, it's not, I'm not here to brag. Like it, this it's is all about important financial guys. transparency. Yeah. It's, imp it's important for you guys to understand like, don't be afraid of the sticker shock if you're coming from a lower cost of living area. Like right. when you're making more money, like it does go farther. Do the math and you'll see. And this is not to brag. We believe also for anyone who is not medical who is watching this, the compensation for a nurse anesthetist or a registered nurse are not being passed off to you in medical bills. So oh, paying so a nurse say. what they need to make to pay off their loans and to buy a house doesn't make your medical bills more expensive. What makes your medical bills more expensive is for profit CEO. For profit healthcare. <laughs> So you can look into Kaiser, HCA, Adventist, all of these large corporations. When they're running healthcare as a for-profit business, your medical bills are going to the CEO's pockets. Unrestricted pharmaceutical companies, yes. insurance companies, the fact that they exist at all inflates the price of healthcare. And that's like a whole nother conversation. Um, I really recommend that you guys read this book. I, I could pop it up on screen. Yeah. The American Healthcare Paradox, mm -hmm. why spending more is getting us less. Yes, it's And so good. it just like literally spells out the numbers and like explains why American healthcare costs so much and how our outcomes are way worse than other developed nations. It's, it's actually a really scary. System. It's a very frightening thing. But anyway, back to what we were saying. So staff nurse in California. <laughs> staff nursing in California, the reason that they are paid well is because their union has negotiated from the hospital. And then paying all of those nurses well is coming out of the profit that the hospitals are taking. So this is not being passed off to the patients and the medical bills. Paying a nurse what they are worth or paying them so that they can buy a house, pay off their student loan debt, retire, pay for their kids' college, that is being taken from like the CEO's profits. So again, paying nurses what they're worth, it improves patient outcomes. You're gonna have less That's chances of mortality. Way you want mortality. an experienced nurse if possible. Hospitals are incentivized. This is a whole separate podcast. Hospitals are incentivized to hire new grad nurses and burn them out within a year and a half because they're cheaper. So like they're a new grad her. nurse who makes $55,000 a year, if you can get a year and a half out of that new grad nurse and then get a new new grad nurse to replace them, that is the best case scenario for a hospital because then you never have to pay an experienced nurse what they are worth. And then it saves the hospital money at the expense of patient safety. And they don't care that, you know, the infection rates are higher, the yeah. fall rates are higher, that yeah. things are going to get missed and like things are going to be caught later because a new grad doesn't know what to look for. Like that is why, you know, and it's normal and it's not to like shift the blame to you guys or shift more anxiety to you guys. But that's why we created Confident Care Academy yeah. and have an entire like in-depth course about critical care. No one's teaching you guys this <laughs> and nobody knows what to look out for and things get missed and patients die. Yep. I could tell you a million stories about things that have gotten missed because we didn't have experienced staff at just various facilities, even the top facilities in the nation with decent staffing. Like yep. it's just these things fall through the cracks when we don't have experience. Nurses Hospitals around. cut training time because it saves them money. And the only thing at the end of the day, it's like nurses advocating for their patients and themselves versus for-profit medicine. That's really what it boils down to. And California is doing a great job at the nurses advocating for themselves and for their patients. Again, read this book, A Collective Bargain, and read, what is it, The American Paradox? The American Healthcare Paradox. American Healthcare Paradox, that'll be linked in the description below. Then the last point that is never considered when nurses are saying, I make just as much money as a CRNA, as a travel nurse. They're not comparing apples to apples. They're comparing apples to oranges because you're comparing travel nursing to, to staff, staff CRNA. CRNA. And there's also travel CRNA. Yeah. And we don't call it travel CRNA yeah. because we don't typically have agencies. Like the way that travel nursing tends to work is you usually get hired through an agency like Aya or Vivian or whatever. And then they have all of the contracts of the hospitals that they work with. And then they give you their, you know, skimpy benefits package. And then you like select from there. You, you pick and choose and you cherry pick contracts through them in order to keep your health insurance and your like 
embarrassingly low 401k matching and all that stuff. So with CRNAs, we do it a little differently. Mm -hmm. CRNAs tend to contract themselves out to hospitals. So you can actually go to a hospital or a group yourself. You could just like email a chief and be like, yo, are you hiring locums? What's more common is we do have headhunters, which feels more like a travel agency, right? right? So there's a headhunter, they like know about the contacts at the different places and they like kind of negotiate for you, but you can negotiate directly yourself and you're contracting yourself out to the hospital directly with or without the help of this headhunter. You're not going through like one massive agency. So the agency is not employing you, the hospital or the private group is employing you and you are getting a much higher hourly rate you also are often getting malpractice coverage through the group. You can negotiate for that. Sometimes it's included up front, sometimes it's not, but usually you can ask for that and they give it to you. Um, also, malpractice insurance is like not that, not expensive. that expensive. Everybody thinks it's like a million dollars a year. It's like a couple grand a year. It's, it's like, like not that much. Three to five grand in my limited research, but I'm also not the most knowledgeable about this yet, but people sometimes say it's one of those myths that circulates like, oh, you can't do locums because you have to pay your own malpractice. You're like, ah, it's, it's not that, not that big of a Like factor. if you're making yeah. $230 an hour, like you can afford it, I promise. <laughs> yeah. And then they also get these different, you also get like that housing stipend too sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it just depends. But I mean, the I have a friend right now who has a locums contract in the New York City area and he's getting paid $185 an hour. He's getting $6,000 a month in a housing stipend, $800 on top of that in a transportation stipend. Yeah. And he's working four, 10 hours a week. So he's working 40 hours a week at a facility that treats him well. He really likes it. He keeps renewing the contract. It's paying more than enough for his New York City rent. That's amazing. Yeah. There are contracts in the area that are also paying $230 an hour, but like no housing stipend. Right. There are it's contracts. Whether it's like a blended package versus like yeah. just the hour. And you can like negotiate and, and yeah. pick and choose. If you pick a package in like the middle of nowhere, like the Midwest or like some rural area, Montana, you're gonna get paid <laughs> even more than that. Like you can easily get paid, you know, 300, 400 grand a year as a locum CRNA if you play your cards right. Now again, you're walking away from paid time off. Again, you're maybe paying for your own health insurance. Again, you're not getting all those retirement benefits and matching and like, you know, student loan forgiveness opportunities right. and all of those things but you are making double of what a travel nurse could make. So if a travel nurse could at most make 200 grand a year, yeah. a CRNA who's doing locums contracts can easily make 400 right. with like that similar type of work. And that's without working 60 hour contracts, right? Yeah, and that's where the apples to oranges comparison is a factor. Like you really can't compare travel nursing to your maximum amount that you can make as a CRNA because it's ignoring travel CRNAs. It's ignoring locums. And if you want to check out some of those jobs, you can just go scroll on Gasworks for a little bit. You'll quickly see there's a lot of jobs available. You can see the 350 to 425k job postings. I will also add, like there's a reason that that compensation is so high. It's such a higher level of responsibility for patient outcomes. Yeah, you're not and doing like, the work of a bedside nurse. It's you're literally liability. <laughs> you're responsible for the patient's care like in the same way that a physician anesthesiologist is. And I know I'm going to get like the internet exploding over this, but you know, there are plenty of CRNA jobs where you're giving anesthesia independently and those are the ones that are typically the most compensated. You can bill yourself like like for the insurance companies, right. Medicare, Medicaid, you can work alone with like a dentist, a podiatrist, a plastic surgeon, like you can go to these little centers and just be working and doing that same scope and role, right? So you're doing that job. Right. And typically a physician anesthesiologist who's working those little gigs or a rural place would be making even more money than that. So like, again, for people who are outraged that nurses could make that much money, this is just how anesthesia works. This is just how insurance companies and the US healthcare system works. And what we really need to be advocating for is a universal healthcare system. <laughs> but... yeah. Universal healthcare system is the answer for all of our woes and one day we can like help write some of the policies for that. It'll be great. <laughs> but in the meantime, it is important for people who are trying to decide whether or not they want to go back to school so that they can have all of the information at their disposal so that they're making the most informed decision. That's what's really important. And I think there's a lot of myths that circulate about compensation and travel nursing versus anesthesia. And there's not a lot of information that's forward facing and easily accessible where you can figure out really what's gonna be the best choice for you. So at the end of the day, again, like if you're solely looking at compensation profiles, comparing the most money that you can make as a travel nurse to anesthesia is really not the exact right comparison because you really do need to be comparing 
travel nursing versus locums at right. that point. That's more of an apples to apples comparison versus a travel nursing to a new grad staff CRNA in Georgia. Right. Like that's not And the of same course comparison. you should do what you love and like not yeah. everybody wants to give anesthesia in the OR. Again, that's a very niche job, right? right. Giving anesthesia, it's a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. You're doing procedures, you're one to one with the patient, you're watching vital signs, you're dealing with the personalities of the OR, you're giving blood, you're giving fluids, like you're doing this one to one management of patient care and like coming up with a medication cocktail that's going to optimize outcomes right. and like, you know, when emergencies happen, you're the one who's responsible, you run the code, like all of this is on you. This is very different than the team environment of being an ICU nurse where you have like lots of help around and like you're all figuring it out together. Like anesthesia is not right for everyone. Um, some people think it's boring. I think those people are crazy, but it's just, you know, it's it's a very unique job. I don't think it's job. boring. <laughs> I love it. It's 90% boredom, 10% sheer terror, but when I'm bored, I'm so happy. Like I know I'm doing a good job and you're my also patient's teaching. Taking care of. Like if you are, especially when you're working in these kind of larger facilities. My observation as like a first year student who's only really done shadowing is that a lot of times you have a resident in there, like you're teaching. So like, even if there's some downtime, a lot of times you're like talking over medications and drugs and like all of these things, like or they, just, there may be some downtime. Or sometimes but, like, you just get close with like the staff in the operating room. Yeah, and you're I usually become friends with the OR nurses and the right. surgeons and like the anesthesiologists. Like we all kind of just like become friendly and like get through the day together. like. And it's a great work know, environment. It's nice. And again, like you should never choose like healthcare or any job, like only because of the compensation profile. We're really just talking about this to kind of dispel some of the myths. Yeah. And don't get Christy scared off if you're just like afraid of the, the three year sacrifice. Like grad exactly. school is grueling. It, it is no joke, but also it's three years of your life for mm -hmm. a, a career that's going to give you a lot of longevity and it's going to treat you well and compensate you well. Right. As opposed to like grinding eternally and burning out. So, right. and again, like, I wish that bedside nursing had the conditions that California do everywhere because yeah. I think most of us would either stay at the bedside longer or maybe forever. Like I think that right. all of us really do love nursing. Like I loved being an ICU nurse, but I also knew that like eventually I would hit my limit and I wouldn't be able to do it anymore. So I chose to go back to grad school while I was young mm -hmm. so that I could give myself a career with longevity sooner. But if bedside nursing looked like California, I don't know if I would have made that same decision. I think I would have waited a much longer time. So even in relation to travel nursing too, I would not have left my staff job at a really excellent high acuity CBCU had the working conditions not deteriorated so much during COVID. I loved learning. I loved my, we talked about this yesterday. I loved my attending physicians, the cardiac anesthesiologists and the critical care fellows. They're always so They're good so to work with. They're always the best. Good. Like the teaching they, they love was, teaching. The teaching was amazing. I'm really lucky to have that foundation. And I wouldn't have left had COVID not made the working conditions really horrible. And if I had been a staff nurse in California, I probably wouldn't have ever traveled nursed. Or grad school, I don't know. The thing is, is like, if I'm able to eat lunch, it's so funny, nurses, like we, <laughs> we just want to eat lunch. <laughs> it's like the bare minimum, right? Like having someone just make sure your patients don't die so you can get a meal in during a 12 hour shift, which is really a 13 hour shift by the time you give, take report and give report, it right? Is. So just to like pee and eat lunch, would have been enough to keep me there. It would have been a game changer. Think about that. I'm so happy. That's <laughs> mind blowing. Anyway, and enough and enough compensation to maybe buy a house and I could have a kid and pay off my student loans. If I was able as a bedside nurse to like buy a house, have a kid, pay for their daycare, and pay off my student loans, the incentive to go to grad school would have been much less because I really loved being an ICU nurse. And again, yeah. I think we're gonna have a podcast about this. Like even just you know like braiding your patient's hair, spa days on Sundays. Like, I think there's something it's really powerful. Love <laughs> I love the act of nursing and anesthesia is still nursing. So I love this aspect of it, but it is a very human job. You're really trying to like give dignity to people in their worst moments of life. And I love that about being an ICU nurse and I hope to carry that with me in anesthesia, but nurses just deserve better. So that's why you should read this book. <laughs> All and, right, we'll stop torturing you guys now. And please <laughs> comment what you would like for us to talk about next time. Uh, this is the Confident Care Academy podcast. These are excerpts where we talk about nursing topics. The Confident Care Academy, the membership, is where we dig into pharmacology, deep dive in critical care, even travel nursing, financial education topics. That's all in the membership, which will be linked in the description as well. And CRNA school admissions tips as well. <laughs> all right, see you next time. Bye.